Welcome to part seven in our journey through the amazing book of Hebrews. And today we're going to be finishing up chapter four and moving into the first half of chapter five. Now, let me remind you that this is a unique verse-by-verse Bible study series because we're looking at Hebrews through an apologetic lens to learn about true biblical Christianity, where our doctrines and beliefs came from, and to defend those beliefs against false theologies on all sides, from the the pseudo-spiritualism of progressive Christianity to the suffocating legalism of Torah-observant Christianity. And the book of Hebrews offers a tremendous insight into the historical and biblical roots of our faith. Because as we've seen, it is so grounded in and tied to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. In previous episodes, we've covered a lot of historical and literary background. We talked about how the book of Hebrews was written by a Jewish writer to an audience primarily made up of Jewish believers in Jesus who were undergoing persecution or or at least a lot of friction for their faith in Christ. And the author wrote this letter to encourage them, and by extension us today, to hold fast to their faith. So we put together this handy roadmap of the book. And as you can see, the way the author is encouraging his readers to hold fast to their faith is by pointing out the superiority of Jesus over everything else they might be tempted to put their faith in. We've already seen in chapters one through four how he's shown that Jesus is greater than the angels and greater than Moses. And now we're moving into the big middle section where he's gonna build an incredible case for the superiority of Christ over the entire Mosaic system of worship given under the Old Covenant law, with its priesthood and temple and and rituals and sacrifices. And he's even gonna demonstrate how the new covenant of Christ is superior to the old covenant made at Sinai that, that Israel wasn't able to keep. And I just wanna point out up front that there's a very interesting pattern beginning to develop here in the book of Hebrews. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, there was a ritual of anointing people to certain offices by pouring oil over their head, right? For example, when someone was being appointed to the office of king, they would be anointed with oil. We see the same thing happen for those called to the the priesthood and those called to, to be prophets, right? And the Hebrew word for anointed one is Mashiach. And this is where we get the English word Messiah. And in Greek, the word for anointed one is Christos, which is where we get the English word Christ. So, by the way, whenever you see the word Christ in the Bible, which is used over 500 times in the New Testament, it's not a name, it's a title. You can replace it in your mind with the word Messiah. It means the same thing. So, here's where all these concepts come together. In the New Testament, we see Jesus as the promised Mashiach, Messiah, the Christ, we see Jesus fulfilling all three of these offices. This is commonly referred to as the threefold office of Christ, or in Latin, it's munis triplex. And the book of Hebrews is following this pattern. We saw the prophetic ministry of Jesus described in chapter one. In fact, the author begins establishing that office in the very first sentence of this letter. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So the author highlights the prophetic function of Christ, the greatest of all prophets, speaking to us, the people, on behalf of God. And then in chapter three, he compares Jesus to Moses. And he says, now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ, Messiah, is faithful over God's house as a son. So Moses was a servant in God's house, but Jesus is a son over God's house. He's speaking of a status of authority, lordship, of, of royalty, Messiah as king. And of course, the book of Hebrews as a whole reveals that the kingship of Jesus extends to the entire cosmos. And today, we're going to pick up at the very end of chapter 4, where the author begins to look at the priesthood of the Messiah, Jesus, and shows us how he is a better high priest than any that came before him. And in fact, he's going to be using the priesthood of Jesus over the coming chapters to show his superiority over the entire Old Covenant system of rituals and worship, right, that the priests were in charge of. 
And in today's passage and in the next couple chapters, we'll see how Jesus as a high priest is far superior to Aaron, who was the greatest high priest under the old covenant. And then in chapter eight, the author will take a look at how Jesus is a high priest of a greater covenant than the old covenant. And in chapter nine, he's a priest who serves in a greater sanctuary. And in chapter 10, Jesus is a high priest who offers a greater sacrifice. And in all, in all these comparisons, he's showing how Jesus is infinitely superior to the entire Old Covenant system. And the reason he's drawing these comparisons, as we've discussed in previous episodes, is because the author is writing to a primarily Jewish audience who were enduring persecution for their faith in Jesus, both from their non-believing Jewish friends and family and from the Roman government, for whom Christianity was an illegal religion and would be for the next few centuries. So these Jewish believers were being tempted to drift back to the old covenant temple rituals and priesthood that they were used to, because that would ease the pressure that they were feeling because of their faith in Christ. And the author's continuous refrain in this letter is, hold fast to your faith, hold fast to your confidence in Christ. So with that, let's jump in. To remind us of the context and where we last left off, we're coming out of a long section in which the author of Hebrews was encouraging his readers to strive to enter God's rest. He had pointed to the ancient Israelites who died in the wilderness and weren't able to enter God's rest because of their unbelief. And he warns his readers, hey, don't be like your ancestors who fell in the wilderness because of their unbelief. He's encouraging them to keep the faith. And then he used this poetic imagery about the Word of God being living and active and and sharper than any two-edged sword to remind us that God knows the completeness of a person. He knows the deepest parts of our nature, even down to our thoughts and our intentions. And depending on where you are in your faith, that idea can either be tremendously comforting or downright scary. And that brings us to verse 14, where we'll pick up today. So, we've already seen the author refer to Jesus as our high priest twice, first in Hebrews 2.17 and then again in 3.1. But here's where he's going to start building a case and show how Jesus fulfilled two of the major requirements for a high priest. And I'm just going to read through the entire passage first, and then we'll break it down. And by the way, I'll mostly be reading from the ESV translation today. So, we're in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. The Word of God. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our, our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the author's making some really important connections in, in the minds of his first century readers here. And, and just like he's done throughout this epistle up until now, He's building a case from the Torah to show how Jesus fulfills two of the major requirements for a high priest of God. 
So let's work our way through this passage. Our passage begins with the statement, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And as usual for the author of Hebrews, he's packed a whole lot of theology into one sentence. Now, the Greek conjunction that he starts with, un, is typically translated using the English word therefore. However, the ESV translates it as since then, to, to reflect the sort of the, the adversative or contrasting way that the author is using this conjunction. In other words, rather than leading into a conclusion from what immediately precedes this text, it's best to understand it as the author resuming a topic after an interruption. And in our case, the interruption was the passage from Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 13. And we walked through that larger passage, which was all about entering God's rest in the last couple episodes. That was a sort of sidebar for the author. And now he's picking up a line of thought about Christ's priesthood that, that he actually began in early, uh, early in chapter 3. There he referred to Jesus as the high priest of our faith and showed how Jesus, the Son, is greater than Moses, the servant. And then he picks up here in chapter 4 saying, Since then, we have a great high priest, and this is an inclusive we, speaking of all believers, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. He's reminding his readers of the lofty, glorious position of Jesus with which he began this letter. Right? We've talked before about the high Christology of the author of Hebrews. He continually portrays Christ as divine. Jesus wasn't merely a wonderful human rabbi or a gifted teacher, as some people want to claim. In the opening verses of chapter 1, the author said that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And here in chapter 4, he says that Jesus passed through the heavens, referring to the exaltation and ascension of Christ, who ascended to the highest sanctuary in the universe and entered the very presence of God. And the author is going to expand on this idea of a greater sanctuary in, in a few chapters. Luke Johnson writes this in his commentary, The description of Jesus as high priest is here meshed with the imagery of enthronement which we saw earlier in 1, 3 and 13 and, two, and chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Jesus is a priest who has passed through the heavens. This is the only time Hebrews uses the verb dierkome, and it gives the reader the sense of a spatial journey that penetrates through heavenly realms into God's presence. And later, Hebrews will use a similar spatial image when it pictures Jesus as priest entering into the heavenly sanctuary. And because our high priest is so glorious and is the Son of God, the author of Hebrews says, let us hold fast our confession. And now this is an echo of what he wrote earlier in Hebrews 3, 6, hold fast our confidence. And here he says, hold fast our confession. And these two phrases are essentially mean the same thing. Let us cling to our confession of faith in Jesus, our confidence in Jesus, and not drift away because our confidence is in the Son of God Himself, and through Him, we have the promise of eternal life in God's family, in His household. So the author's relating his distinctive teaching about Jesus as not just a high priest, but he calls him a great high priest. And he's linking that to the idea he developed back in chapters 1 and 2 about Christ as Son of God. And now he begins to expound on the priesthood of Jesus. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So this is sort of the flip side of the coin to what the author wrote back in chapter 2, verse 18. There he said that because Jesus himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And here in chapter 4, he makes the same statement, but in the negative. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and he adds, yet without sin. So here's one of several places in the New Testament where we're directly told that Jesus never sinned. He was without sin. And the author of Hebrews is going to use this as a point of distinction between Jesus 
and the Levitical high priests who were commanded to offer sacrifices for their own sin. And notice the implication here. The author says Jesus did experience weakness, and He did experience temptation, right? But He never sinned. This means that weakness and temptation are not, in and of themselves, sinful. They can certainly lead to sin, but they're not the same thing as sin. So while Jesus may have experienced those same urges and weaknesses of the flesh that we do, He never crossed the line. He never sinned. He always responded to those human temptations and urges by following and keeping God's will. Now, the fact that the author has twice, re twice repeated the idea that Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses and temptation suggests that the author was addressing an objection that in some way Christ was just too lofty and remote to really understand or sympathize with us like the human priests were able to do. And if that's the case, well, then the author wants to assuage that fear in his readers. In fact, he's saying that our confidence in Jesus as our high priest is directly related to his ability to sympathize with our weakness. And the Greek verb for sympathize is sympatheo, which literally means suffer along with. And interestingly, that word is only found twice in the New Testament, and both times are here in the book of Hebrews. We see it here in 4.15, and we'll see it again in, in chapter 10. So what is Jesus sympathizing with? Well, he's sympathizing or suffering along with our weakness and our temptation, right? What an amazing statement. After just declaring the glorious superiority and divinity of Jesus, who became human and suffered as a human along with us, and yet remained without sin, Jesus, the very Son of God, from His position of strength, can sympathize with our weaknesses. What a beautiful portrait of who Christ is. And because of that, the author concludes in verse 16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so there are three important ideas I want to point out in this verse. First, he says we can approach God with parousia, confidence or boldness. We can approach God with a lack of fear that we might be rejected or, or harmed or scorned in His presence. Rather, when we're in Christ, we can confidently expect to find grace and receive mercy in God's presence. Donald Guthrie writes this, This is one of the most striking features about the Christian way to God, that it is unencumbered even by a man's sense of awe in God's presence. It is perfectly reflected in the Lord's Prayer, where the use of an, of an address like Our Father reveals a marvelous boldness. And secondly, the author says, we draw near to what he calls the throne of grace. So a throne stands for authority and royalty and power. And these things are all true of God, of course. But the author refers to it here as the throne of grace. And who's there at the throne? Again, he told us back in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is seated, meaning he is on the throne himself at the right hand of the majesty. And he is our guarantee, our confidence, that the throne of God will be a place of grace for those who have put their faith in Jesus. And third, when we draw near to the throne of God, when we enter his presence, what does the author say will be dispensed from the throne? He says, we will find mercy and grace. The authors already described Jesus as a merciful high priest back in 217. And the mercy and grace we find in the presence of God is unlimited, it's infinite, and it'll be given to us to help in our time of need. The psalmist put it this way, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And just like the author said in the last chapter, today is the day to enter God's rest. And when is our time of need? It's today, it's right now. As the old hymn says, Lord, I need you every hour I need you. So we're just three verses into our passage and already the author has preached a sermon. This is so good. And here's what's so amazing about the Christian faith. 
Christ calls us to deny ourselves and give up our lives and follow him. Our calling is high and it's demanding and it's not for the faint of heart. But unlike every other belief system, including even atheism, where you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and, and channel your inner strength, right? And dig deep in every day in order to reach your better life. Unlike that, the high calling of Christ comes with a promise. He promises that we will be given the grace and strength we need to meet that high calling. And it doesn't come from inside us. It comes from outside of us, from God himself. The psalmist writes, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The Apostle Paul wrote, But the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, says Paul, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So God equips and strengthens those he calls. And when we come to faith in Jesus, his righteousness is credited to us. And this is the reason that we can approach the throne of grace with such boldness and confidence in parousia. Because it's not about us and our work, it's about Jesus and the work that he's done on our behalf. Okay, with that, the author is now going to move into a comparison between Aaron, the very first high priest under the Sinai Covenant, and Jesus, our great high priest under the New Covenant. We've talked about this before, but it's important to remember as we work our way through this text that it was written when the temple in Jerusalem was still standing and the Levitical priesthood was still fully operational. So what we look at as ancient history today were actually current events for the, for the original readers of this epistle. And when this letter was written, Jewish believers in Jesus could, could look out their window, so to speak, and see the temple off in the distance with the smoke from the burnt offerings rising into the air and, and the bustling activity of the, of the priesthood. So with that in mind, let's work our way through chapter 5, starting at verse 1. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So the author is sort of just relating some historical information about the Levitical priesthood here. He's reminding his Jewish readers what the Torah commanded of the high priest. And he's also establishing a background for the superior priestly order that he's about to introduce. And here he invokes the name of Aaron, who of course was the brother of Moses and the very first Levitical high priest. And Aaron carried a lot of weight with first century Jews. He was seen as the ideal high priest. Aaron was appointed by God himself, who said that only Aaron and his descendants could serve as priests. God told Aaron in Numbers 18, starting at verse 6, I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, dedicated to the Lord to do the work at the tent of meeting. And so the tent of meeting is the tabernacle that later became the temple. Verse 7, But only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I am giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. So God only appointed Aaron and his sons, his descendants, to serve as priests in his temple. And the readers that the, authors, uh, that the author of Hebrews is writing to were, were keenly aware that this was no longer happening in the first century. There were serious problems with the priesthood at that time. So, so let's take a minute to understand what those problems were, because it's going to help us appreciate the point that the author's making. So we read in John 10 how Jesus celebrated the Feast of Dedication at the temple in Jerusalem with his fellow Jews. And this was an annual feast to commemorate the rededication of the Jewish temple after it was desecrated by the, the Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes. In the second century BC, Epiphanes had launched a massive campaign of oppression against the Jewish people. 
and, the, and he ultimately captured, captured the temple in Jerusalem and, and turned it into a place of pagan worship. And after a long drawn out war, the Jewish fighters led by Judah Maccabee finally recaptured Jerusalem, retook control of the temple and cleansed it and rededicated it, which is what the, the Feast of Dedication is all about. That feast is still celebrated today by the Jewish people. It's known as Hanukkah. But here's the thing. The role of the Jewish high priest had been contested going all the way back to the Greek occupation, and it lasted through the Maccabean Revolt and all the way up to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So first century Jews were acutely aware that the position of high priest no longer followed the line of Aaron as God had commanded in the Torah. By then, the high priesthood was often obtained through corruption or bribery or foreign influences. Herod the Great appointed outsiders as priests, and, and even some Roman politicians like Quirinius exercised the right of appointing Jewish high priests. So this was the world in which the author of Hebrews was writing about the high priesthood. Brian Dyer says this, Some literature from the period demonstrates disgust at the perceived corruption of the high priesthood, while other sources uphold a continued reverence for the position and the priesthood. Sirach is an excellent example of a text that highly regards the, the priesthood while reflecting on Aaron as the ideal priest. So he's referring to the book of Sirach, which wasn't included in the Jewish Bible, and, and for that reason, it's also not part of the Protestant Bible. So the book of Sirach is what's called a deuterocanonical book, which means a book that's included in the Catholic and Orthodox Old Testament, but it's considered apocryphal or outside of the accepted canon of Scripture by Jews and Protestant Christians. So, however you happen to regard the book of Sirach, it's a very important piece of literature from a historical perspective. It existed in both Hebrew and Greek by the first century, and it was well known to Jewish readers. And Dyer points out that Sirach offers two helpful insights into what the author of Hebrews is getting at in chapter 5. Again, it's not scripture, at least in my opinion, but it does help us get inside the minds of his Jewish readers. So first, the book of Sirach expresses great reverence for the priesthood. In, in fact, the author, Ben Sirach, stresses proper worship and proper sacrifices and admiration for the priests. This is a reflection of how Jews viewed the priesthood at that time. And secondly, and more directly for our purposes, Sirach reveals how Aaron was regarded in Jewish thinking as the ideal high priest. He talks about how Aaron was exalted and blessed by God and given glory and authority. Dyer summarizes what Sirach said, and he's citing passages from the book of Sirach here. He says, God chose Aaron from among the, all the living and made a covenant with him. To him was given the priesthood, of which he was the first, and this was to be passed down among his descendants. Aaron and his descendants' role as priests included ministering to God, blessing God's people, and making atonement for them. So, Sirach is stressing the importance of the priestly line and holding up Aaron as the ideal high priest against whom all later priests would be compared. And this is a far cry from what the first century Jews were experiencing in the priesthood. So, with that cultural and, and historical background, we get a better sense of what the author's doing in, in the opening verses of chapter 5 and why he brings up Aaron, the ideal high priest. And in these verses, he's highlighting two biblical qualifications for a high priest of God. First, a high priest must be human so that they can act on behalf of and represent human beings before God. He says in verse 1, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And the author then begins a, a series of contrasts here. He just said at the end of chapter 4 that from his position of strength, Jesus can empathize with our human weakness. But he says this about the Levitical high priest, uh, verse 2. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. So Jesus operates from a position of strength, but the Old Covenant high priest operates from a position of weakness. And not just weakness, but sin. Jesus was tempted as we are, but he never sinned. 
The Levitical high priest did, though. In fact, the author says this about that high priest, verse 3. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people, right? So Jesus is our sinless high priest as compared to the old covenant high priests who had to make atonement for their own sin. And then the author introduces the second qualification of a high priest in verse 4. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. And that may be a subtle jab at the illegitimate high priests in recent memory for the author and his first century readers. So in these first four verses of chapter five, he lays out these two qualifications for a high priest. First, they need to be human so they can represent humans before God. And second, they must be appointed to the priesthood by God. And in the verses that now follow, he's going to show how Jesus fulfills both of these criteria. He addresses them in, in reverse, in a, in a chiastic order, starting with the appointment of Jesus to the position of high priest. Verse 5, so also, in other words, just like Aaron, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So the author's point is that God the Father appointed Jesus the Son as high priest. And he cites two Old Testament passages to support this idea. The first quote comes from Psalm 2-7, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And this is the exact same text that the author quoted back in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. In fact, it was his first quote from the Old Testament in this letter. And there he quoted this text to give his readers an exalted view of Jesus as the Son of God. And here he quotes it a second time to link that exalted view of Jesus to his appointment as our high priest. He wants his readers to understand in no uncertain terms that Jesus is a legitimate high priest appointed by and acceptable to God. Bishop Montefiore said, only a high priest who is son of God can have his rightful place at God's right hand. And the author's second quote here also comes from a psalm. In this case, Psalm 110, verse 4. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And by the way, Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. It speaks of the coming Messiah, and it portrays him as both a king and a priest. So we have the, the two offices of Christ, the Messiah, revealed in Psalm 110. And this connection wouldn't have been lost on his Jewish readers. So here in Hebrews, the author's applying this messianic psalm to Jesus to reveal two important contrasts between the high priesthood of Aaron and that of Jesus. First, Jesus is a priest forever, right? Unlike Aaron who died, and unlike every other high priest in history, the priesthood of Jesus is eternal. And as the author will expound on in later chapters, the reason the priesthood of Jesus will last forever is because of the perfection of Jesus. Unlike the priesthood of Aaron, which gave way to a better priesthood in Jesus, the priesthood of Jesus can never be improved or made better. And therefore, it'll never be replaced or come to an end. And think about what that means for us. If the priesthood of Christ is eternal, then everything that it accomplishes, everything it does for us, every benefit we receive from Christ, our high priest, is also eternal. And if that's the case, why would we ever lose faith in him? This is the fundamental message of this letter. The author's telling his readers, yes, I, I know you're under pressure and persecution, but Jesus is your high priest. And unlike the order of Aaron, which you're tempted to return to, the priesthood of Christ is eternal. And he's saying that's why you need to hold fast to your confession and your confidence and not lose faith. The whole reason the author is going through all these comparisons between Jesus and Aaron, and the reason he's going to make all these esoteric priestly connections, is because he's emphasizing the fact that our salvation is ultimately based on the ability of Christ to provide it. He is who our confidence is placed in. And the second contrast the author makes is that the priesthood of Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, or Melchizedek as, as it's pronounced in Hebrew. 
And this is a bit of a mysterious reference that the author is going to develop more in the coming chapters. But he's referring to a man mentioned way back in Genesis 14. Melchizedek is described as the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High. Right? And remember, this is long before the Mosaic Law was given and the Levitical, Levitical priesthood began. And in this short, enigmatic passage in, in Genesis 14, verses uh, 17 through 20, we read about how Melchizedek brings bread and wine to Abraham and blesses him, and Abraham gives Melchizedek a tithe, a tenth of everything. And then strangely, we don't hear so much as a whisper about Melchizedek again until Psalm 110, and the verse that the author of Hebrews cited. And after that one verse in Psalm 110, we don't hear another thing about Melchizedek until the author of Hebrews brings him up here in chapter 5 and following. So it's a bit of a mysterious reference which the author will use several more times before he finally expounds on the connection between Melchizedek and Jesus, which we'll get to in chapter 7. But the point we can take away from today's passage is that the priesthood of Jesus is based on a different order than that of Aaron. Christ's priesthood is after the order of, or in the way of, the priesthood of Melchizedek. And this won't become evident until later on, but the author's beginning to anticipate the protest that Jesus didn't meet an important qualification for a high priest under the Old Covenant. He wasn't from the tribe of Levi. And here the author starts to lay the groundwork for his response that by pointing out that Jesus is not a high priest in the order of Aaron, in the order of the Levitical priesthood, but rather in the order of Melchizedek. And now the author starts supporting Christ's other qualification of being human. Verse 7, In the days of his flesh, in other words, he's referring to when Christ walked the earth as a human, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So he's reflecting on the humanity of Jesus. Donald Guthrie writes this, He seems to want to dispel any idea that Jesus is a mystical, non-historical figure by abruptly reminding the readers what happened in the days of his flesh. The expression is interesting because it draws attention to the reality of his human life. The writer has already made this clear in chapter 2, see verses 14 and 17, but the present reference much more vividly introduces a clear allusion to the historical record of the life of Christ. In fact, in this passage, the author is really portraying Jesus as a passionate and sympathetic and dedicated high priest. He says that Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. This is the ideal role of a, of a faithful high priest petitioning God on behalf of his fellow human beings. And the author seems to be thinking specifically of Christ's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what a profound insight into what Christ went through for us. In his human state, to drop to his knees in the garden and, and feel the agony and the weight of his impending violent, painful death. Je Jesus had likely seen others crucified. And here he was in the middle of the night, all alone, crying out to God. Right? His clueless disciples couldn't even keep their eyes open. And they kept drifting off to sleep while Jesus, our high priest, with a pit in his stomach and a sense of dread on his heart, was sweating drops of blood on our behalf. My wife and I perform music with the prison ministry, and we had a unique opportunity to sing to the men on death row at Riverbend Max Security here in Nashville. It was a surreal experience to, to talk with and sing to these men who had been sentenced to death. Every lyric we sang hit differently and more deeply. I was sitting in a room locking eyes with a group of men who, had all, who would all one day be lying alone in the dark in their prison cell on the night before their execution. Maybe they would cry out to God and try to barter with him, you know, give me more time. I don't want to die tomorrow, right? I promise I'll dedicate my life to you if you spare me. Jesus not only spent the entire night before his execution alone in the dark crying out to God, 
just like the, the men on death row will one day do, he also willingly accepted his execution because of those men on death row. It was because of those murderers and rapists and because of the rest of us sinners who just as desperately need to be reconciled with God. Jesus didn't want to die, but he was willing to. That night in the garden, he said, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This is what the author of Hebrews was, was talking about at the end of chapter 4 when he said, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And here's the amazing thing. The, the prayers and supplications of Jesus were more than just for himself. Even as the author of Hebrews was writing this, even as you're listening to this teaching today, Jesus is on the throne in heaven in the presence of God, still offering prayers for you and for me. This is the intercession of Christ on our behalf as our high priest. Romans 8.34 says, Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. 1 John 2.1 says, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And later in Hebrews, the author, the author will write, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus is interceding on our behalf as our passionate and sympathetic and dedicated high priest in heaven. And because he took on flesh and walked in the dust and sweat of humanity, because he's been where we are and he knows what it's like, Jesus can sympathize and suffer along with what we're going through, whatever that might be. And the author goes on to say in chapter 5, verse 8, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. This is a really interesting statement because if the sonship of Christ was perfect and he was sinless, why would he need to learn obedience? And why, for example, would Luke say in his gospel that Jesus increased in wisdom? And I think we have to admit that there's a bit of a mystery here and, and why Jesus is referred to in these ways and, and what it really means for him to be fully human, human enough to qualify himself as a representative of the human race and yet still be divine and the second person of the Trinity. In previous episodes, we've seen what, what, what a strong Trinitarian position the author of Hebrews takes. This whole concept reminds me of that remarkable passage in Philippians where the Apostle Paul talks about the obedience and the humanity of Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Obedient to the point of death. Jesus, on his knees in the garden, in the midst of his suffering, chose obedience. And because of that incredible selfless obedience, Paul, Paul goes on to, to exalt and praise Jesus using language similar to what we see in the book of Hebrews. He continues in verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is the same idea that the author of Hebrews is expressing in chapter 5. He's telling us that Jesus, the Son of God, fully conformed to the Father's will for him. And he also seems to be invoking the idea of a son learning obedience as a way to exemplify Christ's solidarity with humanity. And because Jesus was obedient, he says in verse 9, Jesus was made perfect. He became the source of eternal salvation to, to all who obey him. So the author's already shown how suffering is the path through which perfection or completeness is achieved. In chapter 2, verse 10, he said this about Jesus. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, 
in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. He repeats the same idea here in in chapter 5. He learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to who? To all who obey him. So the concept of obedience is linking together all these ideas. Christ was obedient to God, and so we are obedient to Christ. This is what Jesus himself taught in John 15. He said in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So in Hebrews 5, the author's making the point that because Jesus suffered and was made perfect, verse 9, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So the perfection of Christ is the basis of our salvation. And the author repeats in verse 10 that Jesus was designated by God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And it's important to point out here that when he says Jesus was made perfect, through suffering, he's not suggesting that there was once a time when Jesus wasn't perfect. No, in Hebrews 4.15, he plainly states that Jesus was tempted in every respect that we are, and yet he was without sin. And so the idea here is that Jesus was proven to be perfect because he was tested and tempted and he endured suffering and remained sinless. Philip Hughes puts it this way, His sufferings both tested and victoriously endured, attested his perfection, free from failure and defeat. And of course, no merely human high priest could ever claim such a thing. In fact, the old covenant law specifically required the Levitical high priest to make sacrifice for his own sins. Leviticus 16 records the commands for Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And God says this in verse six, Aaron, So the first high priest under the Levitical order, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. And the author of Hebrews is gonna really elaborate on this point in the coming chapters. He's showing that Jesus is a superior high priest to Aaron and all the other high priests who came before him. And in fact, as he repeats in verse 10, Jesus was, designated by God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's again drawing attention to the fact that Jesus was divinely appointed to his priesthood, and he was appointed into a unique priestly order, that of Melchizedek. And at this point, the author's now gonna pivot away from the theme of the priesthood for a bit to to address some serious problems that were affecting his readers. And we're gonna take that as our cue to wrap up this episode. So we'll pick up again next time in chapter 5 at verse 11, where the author issues a stern warning about apostasy and falling away from Jesus. Thanks for tuning in. Shalom.